It's in our lane. It's in our lane. Brain injuries are a common problem in our modern world. Approximately 2 million people experience a head injury each year in the United States, with a total annual cost of over $40 billion. Fortunately, most head injuries are not life-threatening. Only one out of four head injuries are categorized as moderate or severe, while about three out of four are considered mild. A mild brain injury is defined as a head injury with brief or negligible loss of consciousness or memory, with neither lasting more than an hour. Loss of consciousness and direct head impact are not necessary to experience a mild brain injury. The severity of a brain injury is rated according to patient response after trauma, not to the actual damage the brain has suffered. So just because the injury is considered mild does not mean that the injury to the brain is trivial or unimportant. Most head injuries are so mild that they may go undetected by medical professionals. Studies have shown that emergency room doctors may be so concerned with treating the obvious injuries after a fall or car accident that they don't even consider the possibility of brain injury. Undiagnosed mild brain injury costs millions of dollars and can result in years of needless suffering. An unrecognized head injury can cause frustration, depression, unemployment, and even divorce. So the key is to identify brain injury early to prevent these problems. A proper diagnosis can help the brain injured patient get the proper care and attention that will speed recovery. Understanding how the brain can be injured is important, as it can explain the symptoms associated with the injury. The first step to understanding the symptoms is to understand the brain. Let's look at the structure of the brain and examine what happens during an injury. We take our brains for granted. Every day it performs amazing feats of perception, calculation, and memory and we seldom think about it, until something goes wrong. The brain contains over 100 billion nerve cells called neurons, and each of these neurons is connected to hundreds or even thousands of other neurons. These nerve cells transmit trillions of signals to one another via a complex biochemical process. The interactions between these billions of cells make the human brain one of the most complex structures in the universe. The complexity of the brain also makes it vulnerable to injury. Disruption of these intricate electrical connections can cause serious problems. Because the brain is so important to maintaining life, it is well protected. The first layer of protection is the skull, a smooth, round layer of bone that protects the brain from penetrating injuries. Below the skull is the dura mater, a tough, fibrous layer of tissue that acts as another layer of protection and as a shock absorber. It protects the brain from the rough ridges on the inside of the skull. Below the dura mater is the arachnoid layer. Its name comes from the word arachnid, or spider, because it is a spider-like layer of tissues that cushion the brain. Underneath the arachnoid layer is the pia mater. This is a very thin, delicate layer that lies directly over the brain itself. The pia mater and arachnoid membrane are separated by the subarachnoid space. This contains numerous blood vessels and the cerebrospinal fluid, and helps absorb the impact of shocks and acts as a barrier to disease organisms. These three layers, the dura mater, arachnoid layer, and the pia mater, are called the meninges. Infection of these layers is called meningitis. Now we come to the brain itself. The adult human brain weighs about three pounds and is soft and pliable. The large outer part of the brain is the cerebrum. It is made up of two separate hemispheres, the right and left sides of the brain. Each hemisphere of the brain is commonly divided into four lobes, the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. Each of the four lobes has a different function. This is important because the part of the brain that is injured will determine the severity of the injury and the kinds of symptoms that result. The frontal lobe is the area of the brain responsible for higher cognitive functions. These include problem solving, spontaneity, memory, language, motivation, judgment, impulse control, and social and sexual behavior. Broca's area, shown here, is specialized for speech formation. The parietal lobe plays a role in our sensations of touch, smell, and taste. It also processes sensory and spatial awareness, and is a key component in eye-hand coordination and arm movement. The parietal lobe also contains a specialized area called the angular gyra that is responsible for matching written words with the sound of spoken speech. The temporal lobe plays a role in emotions and is also responsible for smelling, tasting, 
perception, memory, understanding music, aggressiveness, and sexual behavior. An area of the temporal lobe, called Wernicke's area, is the language center of the brain. The occipital lobe is at the rear of the brain and controls vision and recognition. Deeper in the brain, below the cerebrum, is the brainstem. As its name suggests, it sits at the base of the brain and is the connecting point between the spinal cord and the brain. The brainstem is the most primitive part of the brain and controls the basic functions of life breathing, heart rate, swallowing, reflexes to sight or sound, sweating, blood pressure, sleep, and balance. Behind the brainstem lies the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the center for body movement and balance. While different portions of the brain can be related to specific functions, it's important to remember that the brain works as one single functioning unit. All the different sections are connected to one another, and many tasks are spread throughout different regions of the brain. An example of how the different parts of the brain work together is illustrated by looking at a common activity, speech. When we decide to say something, the information is processed first in Wernicke's area. That information is then sent to Broca's area, which tells the brain what phrases are to be spoken and sends that information to the motor sections of the brain that tell the body to move the mouth to speak. These pathways in the brain all have to be working properly for us to be able to speak, and disruption to any part of this pathway disrupts the entire process. Now that we have looked at the major components of the brain, Let's look at how the brain can be injured. There are two primary types of closed head injury, localized and diffuse. Localized head trauma is caused when the head strikes or is struck by an object. This can occur during an auto accident, sports activity, a physical assault, or a fall. Half of all head injuries are caused by auto accidents. The key to understanding brain injury is inertia. Inertia is simply the concept that an object will move or stay in place until it is acted upon by an outside source. In mild brain injury, the brain has inertia, and it is the rapid movement of the skull around it that causes injury. Frontal impacts are the most common types of closed head injuries. In a frontal type of impact, the skull stops rapidly, and as the brain moves forward, it slams into the skull. This rapid deceleration of the brain into the skull causes the brain to bruise or bleed. As the brain hits the front of the skull, the temporal lobe can be crushed against the bony ridges at the base of the skull. Another kind of direct head injury is impact from the side. In this example, the temporal and parietal lobes can be bruised. If the back of the head is the point of impact, the occipital lobe can be injured. If the impact is severe, the brain may actually bounce back and strike the opposite side of the skull. This is known as coup contra coup injury. In this type of injury, the primary injury looks like we saw before, but in this case, the brain then bounces back and strikes the opposite side of the head as well. This results in two separate injuries to the brain. The second type of head injury is indirect trauma, which can result in diffuse axonal injury. An axon is the long portion of a nerve cell. Diffuse, mild, traumatic brain injury occurs when the head is subjected to rapid motion, but is not necessarily struck. One common example of this type of injury is a rear-end automobile collision, where the head undergoes rapid acceleration. Another example is in shaken baby syndrome. In diffuse axonal injury, the brain is exposed to rotation or twisting. As we saw earlier, the brain is a complex organ made up of many different parts. Each part of the brain has a different consistency and density. When the brain is rapidly moved, these areas move at different speeds. This can cause nerves to be stretched or torn within the brain. This stretching of the axon can kill the cell and destroy its connection to other cells. Diffuse injuries can occur with or without direct head trauma. Diffuse axonal injury is difficult to diagnose because CAT scans and MRI are not able to detect the microscopic lesions that occur from these type of injuries. The direct and diffuse injuries that can occur in a mild traumatic brain injury are considered the primary injury. Sometimes the primary injury is relatively minor, but the complications from the primary injury, the secondary injury, cause most of the symptoms. The brain is similar to other tissues in the human body. If you injure your thumb, for instance, it will bruise, bleed, or swell. The same is true of the brain. After an impact, the affected part of the brain can bruise, bleed, or swell too. 
Unfortunately, there are big differences between your thumb and your brain. Swelling of your thumb simply causes pain. Swelling of the brain, however, can be life-threatening. Because the pressure can build up within the cranium, compressing the delicate tissues of the brain. Bleeding can occur at the point of injury, and this is called a hematoma. A hematoma can be large or small, and, if it is too big, may require surgery to relieve the pressure. Bruising or contusions can cause swelling of the injured area, which can disrupt blood flow to the brain and destroy nerve cells. These secondary injuries, lack of oxygen, swelling, bleeding, and bruising, are responsible for most of the symptoms associated with mild traumatic brain injury. The consequences of a brain injury depend on the size of the impact and what part of the brain is affected. Let's look at the different areas of the brain and see what types of symptoms are associated with them. The frontal lobe is the largest lobe and the one most likely to be injured. Injuries to this area can cause memory loss, problems with concentration, mood change, strange behavior, and speech problems. The temporal lobe is also frequently injured. Symptoms from the temporal lobe injuries include short and long-term memory problems, increased aggression, increased or decreased sexual behavior, difficulty understanding spoken words, and difficulty recognizing or categorizing faces or objects. Damage to the right temporal lobe can result in persistent talking. Injuries to the parietal lobe can cause the following symptoms. Problems with reading, writing, and mathematics. Difficulty in telling left from right being unable to do more than one thing at a time, inability to name objects, difficulty drawing objects, problems with eye-hand coordination, and lack of awareness of body parts. The occipital lobe is responsible for vision and recognition. Injury to this area of the brain can cause blurred or double vision, light or motion sensitivity, loss of peripheral vision, difficulty tracking objects, difficulty recognizing objects, reading and writing problems, or even temporary blindness. Injuries to the cerebellum are less common from a mild impact. Symptoms of injury to the cerebellum include dizziness, tremors, loss of ability to walk, loss of fine or rapid movements, or slurred speech. Even mild injuries to the brainstem can be very serious, since this portion of the brain controls the critical functions of heart rate, breathing, and digestion. Injuries to the brainstem can cause breathing problems, difficulty swallowing, problems with balance and movement, dizziness, nausea, and sleeping difficulties. Trauma to the brain can also cause problems in movement and sensation throughout the body. Body sensation is spread throughout the surface of the parietal lobe. For instance, an injury to the top part of the brain can result in weakness or movement difficulties in the legs. Injury to any part of the brain will often cause headaches, and this is one of the most common symptoms after a mild traumatic brain injury. Diffuse axonal injuries are more difficult to diagnose because they affect a much wider area of the brain. Diffuse injuries can cause symptoms ranging from brief loss of consciousness at the time of the injury to problems with attention and concentration for weeks or months afterwards. Diffuse injuries can also lead to feelings of being overwhelmed by one's environment, and patients may have difficulty expressing ideas or thoughts clearly. These are some of the warning signs that can indicate mild traumatic brain injury. Loss of consciousness, headache, dizziness, nausea, poor concentration, diminished attention, frustration, or depression. If any of these symptoms are present in a patient, they should be examined carefully for the possibility of mild brain injury. Identifying mild brain injuries can be difficult, since CAT scans, X-rays, and MRI scans seldom detect these injuries. If brain injury is suspected, it is important to see the proper physician for diagnosis. A neuropsychologist is a doctor trained to work with these types of injuries. The expert neuropsychologist can administer special tests to determine if the brain was injured in a traumatic event. The good news about mild brain injury is that most patients recover very quickly, usually in the first six months. The first step in recovering from a mild traumatic brain injury is to simply understand that the brain has been injured. Just knowing this can be a great help, since it explains the unusual symptoms and behavior that the patient may be experiencing. The patient's family, employer, and friends find it easier to be supportive once they understand that the patient's brain was injured. The course of recovery from brain injury can be anywhere from a few weeks to many years, depending on the type of trauma. If the brain injury is more severe, there are a variety of techniques that the neuropsychologist can teach the patient to speed recovery. 
These may include simple things like having the patient use a schedule book to organize his or her day, or having the patient wear a watch with an alarm so that he or she can remember appointments. If the injury is more severe, recovery may be ongoing. Treatment in these cases may require job retraining and the relearning of skills that were lost in the injury. Other problems, such as visual symptoms, may require the care of an ophthalmologist. As we've seen in this video, the brain is a complex structure that can easily be injured. Most head injuries are mild and cause no long-term problems. The recovery process can be sped up considerably if the patient and the patient's family understand the nature of the injury and provide much needed support.